now. And um, If you've got any questions at any time, um, you're very welcome to ask. And if you need to put them in the chat, then that's fine. I'll try and keep my eye on that and make sure that if anything appears there. Um, uh, I answer the question. So I, I'm not setting out to try and, um, and present you with a, a lecture about intellectual property, particularly. Um, it's, very much designed as a taster session to give you a feel for what intellectual property is all about, what you're doing uh, if you choose the intellectual property module. I hope this is going to take about half an hour, but we'll see just how long it goes on for. I've been teaching students who are doing the University of London intellectual property module for um, many years. I can't even quite remember exactly how many years, but a, a long, long time. And I've seen a lot of students through the course. Uh, and to the best of my knowledge, they've all passed, which I'm quite pleased about. Some of them have done very well, some of them have done less well, but that's only to be expected. And um, I realised that, uh, that what I'm trying to do, my mission in working with students, is not just to ensure that they pass the exams, that's usually the most important thing for most students, but, uh, but really more important to me is that students end up as enthusiasts for intellectual property. Uh, and, uh, and I'm pleased to say that several students that I've taught over the years have become really good enthusiasts for intellectual property and gone on to, uh, to, to, to work in the field uh, and in very good jobs in legal practice in the UK and probably elsewhere in the world as well. But I don't know so much what they're doing, but it's the ones in the UK that I'm familiar with. So I'm fairly sure that most students going through the intellectual property module will come out of it uh, with an enthusiasm for the subject. One other thing that I think I need to make plain from the outset is that, um, that I want to teach students the whole syllabus. I don't want um, to cherry pick topics. Uh, and there's a temptation when you're faced with a big new subject to look at the ones that uh, come up most often in the exams for perhaps. Well, in this case, it's probably not a very good strategy. Uh, but more important from my point of view, I want to ensure that, uh, that anybody that I've taught comes out at the end of the course able to say that they are, uh, at least to a certain extent, IP lawyers. And you can't say I'm an IP lawyer, but I don't know anything about patents. That doesn't, doesn't um, bear scrutiny. And if you go for a job interview and say, um, and say, well, I studied intellectual property, but I didn't do patents because I didn't understand it or I didn't, uh, uh, I wasn't so interested in it, uh, then that's not going to look very good either. So I want to produce rounded intellectual property lawyers, or at least, um, at least people who are embarking on the journey to become intellectual property lawyers and have got that rounded start. Um, so um, to any students uh, who want to work with me, very welcome to do so on appropriate terms, but um, uh, I'm not going to um, help uh, help them pick bits of the syllabus to, to learn. I want them to know the whole lot. Um, and of course, that's a matter of, of depth as well as breadth. Um, so you might not know it in, in complete depth, but at least you have uh, an understanding, a basic understanding of, of the whole of the field. So what do we get? What, what are you going to find in the intellectual property course? Um, well, I think there are a number of features of intellectual property law which set it aside from everything else in the University of London syllabus and incidentally make it much the best module to, to study, in my opinion. Um, it's relevant, it's immediate, it's dynamic, and indeed it's exciting. Um, it's relevant because intellectual property crops up in all our everyday activities. Well, perhaps not all of them, but, uh, but for example, things that you use every day, computers, uh, the programs for computers, mobile phones, vacuum cleaners, COVID vaccines, you don't use them every day, but they're certainly a pretty topical issue. Um, all these things are involve intellectual property. Uh, the music that you listen to, the TV shows, the films that you watch, 
um, the works of art that you go and look at in the gallery, all those things involve intellectual property. Um, and that makes it immediate. Uh, intellectual property is the law of music, of literature, of art, of fashion, engineering, technology, marketing, whatever you're interested in, there's an intellectual property angle. Uh, and uh, I think you could get a pretty good grasp of the subject simply by reading cases about motor racing. Uh, there have been a number of motor racing cases in, involving intellectual property, uh, which nicely illustrate a lot of the points that you would find across the whole field. It's always topical. The media carries intellectual property stories every day. Just this week, the High Court uh, dismissed a claim for copyright infringement against the members of the band Rudimental, whom I'd never heard before, but obviously some people have heard of them, uh, and various music publishing companies, which were brought, uh, the action was brought by the creator of the song called Can You Tell Me? So there was a copyright infringement case in the High Court just this week involving, um, involving a song. And just going back last week, you'll find the court um, rejected a claim for trademark infringement brought by the company Oatly, who are manufacturers of oat milk against a smaller oat milk producer court, uh, which was using a trademark pure OT. So oat, effectively Oatly with an L in it against OT, which didn't have an L in it. And, uh, and that's why they lost. Although interestingly, um, do I need to tell you this? But interestingly, it seemed that, um, that Oakley really weren't very enthusiastic about pursuing this case at all. So why they brought it in the first place, I don't know. I suspect, uh, which is an, an important point to bear in mind with intellectual property law, that they had so, uh, a load of um, institutional shareholders and venture capitalists and the like breathing down their necks, telling them that they had to take action to protect their trademark, yeah, even though their lawyers obviously didn't make it a particularly good idea. Um, also, Topical is the fact that, uh, that India and South Africa are lobbying the international intellectual property community for a waiver of intellectual property protection uh, for COVID vaccines. Um, so that's, um, uh, that's a very immediate and relevant and, uh, and important area where intellectual property law is, uh, is under scrutiny at any rate. Uh, and there's a big argument about whether um, whether waiving intellectual property protection for COVID vaccines is going to make any difference, because the reason that COVID vaccines are not being rolled out quickly throughout the world involves much more uh, the, the problems of producing it than the problem that there are, there are patents and indeed other types of intellectual property which are relevant. Uh, excuse me, it's going to stop my throat drying out. Right. Um, intellectual property law is dynamic. The, the law is constantly striving to keep up with technology and with other developments. Um, obviously, the law can't lead technology. You can't put in place a law to deal with technological developments that haven't happened yet. Uh, but the challenge is to try and change the law or try and adapt the law uh, to fit what's going on um, as technology develops, and indeed as, as other areas of activity develop. So um, the way goods are marketed these days, and, and services as well, uh, is very different from what it was 10, 20 years ago. And the law has had to adapt to the fact that most of so much business activity is online these days. And that makes a huge difference. The mere fact that uh, we've moved from, um, uh, from, for example, music, uh, being primarily distributed on physical carriers such as CDs uh, to it being um, streamed and downloaded from the internet means that, um, that we've got to look at new ways of protecting um, the, uh, the recordings which are no longer in physical form. It, and when they're in physical form, you can control the number of CDs that are being produced. Uh, when things are music not in physical form, it's very much more difficult to control people downloading and streaming, and copyright law lies at the heart of the way in which you do that. So as we move into a society where uh, technology enables us to deal with things in immaterial form, we have to find new ways of giving them at least some of the characteristics of material copies, and intellectual property laws do that for us. Um, the law is also dynamic at the moment, regrettably, because so many changes have been caused by the insanity that is Brexit. 
um, a phenomenal amount of legislation has been produced to adapt existing UK intellectual property laws, even though the law isn't changing a great deal. Uh, but the amount of, um, of, of legislation that's been necessary to affect the, the, the changes that have been brought about by Brexit is absolutely incredible. Um, none of which is going to trouble you when you're studying the IP module, I don't think. Um, you just need to know in broad terms what the effect of Brexit has been and will be. And generally speaking, the law is going to continue pretty much as it is until such time as Parliament passes legislation which differs from EU uh, intellectual property legislation um, with a big proviso that uh, the Parliament rarely has time to pass any legislation in the intellectual property field anyway, so it seems highly unlikely that it's ever going to find time to make a difference um, to its intellectual property laws, just changing them uh, to move away from uh, the EU influence laws that we're so familiar with at the moment. And uh, of course, the judges may decide that they're going to uh, move UK law away from EU law as well. I think that's much more likely to happen. And certainly some of our judges and the, the personalities of the judges and the limited number of judges involved in intellectual property, their personalities are very important. Uh, you need to understand where they're coming from and you will get a feel for where they're coming from. You'll get a feel for what bites them, what makes them judge the way they do uh, in the intellectual property field that has a huge influence on the way IP law develops. Um, and I can well see some of them saying in the future that, um, uh, that actually uh, the interpretation laid down by the Court of Justice in Luxembourg was completely wrong. I have to say it made some mad decisions in the intellectual property field. So the judges might well take an opportunity to move UK law away from those um, uh, uh, from uh, from those judgments, so there might be changes there. But I don't see any like in particular likelihood of changes in statutory law. In fact, I think the statutory law is much less likely to move ahead and keep um, keep up with developments than it would be if it was still tied to EU law, because the EU is uh, is producing directives to ensure that intellectual property laws stay up to date and keep in track with technological developments. If the UK is going to ignore those directives in the future, then, uh, uh, then we will stagnate, our law will stagnate, won't we? won't be keeping up to date anything like as well as it should. Um, and intellectual property law is exciting. The constant development of the law, plus the interesting subject matter of the law, makes it, well, in my opinion, the most exciting module in the LLB. When you come to learn intellectual property, the first thing you will notice about it is that it's a big subject. The syllabus is extensive. The module guide is thick. It's much thicker than any of the other module guides I've ever looked at, although I've certainly not looked at all of them. Um, but it does have the merit that there's enough in the module guide to pass the exam. Not enough in the module guide to get a great mark, but it certainly points you to further reading that will get you a great mark. Um, and in addition to that, there's a wealth of additional material, more than is just mentioned in the module guide, which you can explore. Um, there are articles in Intellectual Property Journal, and that, well, there are several Intellectual Property Journals that you might want to look at, um, and articles appearing in them all the time, which will enhance your understanding and give you something else to refer to in the exam. Um, and you'll also find a lot of discussion about intellectual property in other places as well, which I'll come back to in a moment. But intellectual property has to be seen as a collection of several smaller subjects. And I think that's one important thing that you need to bear in mind before you embark on this. Um, each of those subjects is big enough really to be at least half a module in itself. So what you're getting in the intellectual property course um, is an abbreviated version of each of these subjects. It's not, uh, um, it's not in as much depth as it might be, but there simply isn't, isn't time. Um, the approach that the university takes uh, is to deal with the whole of the intellectual property field, or at least most of it, um, to a certain depth. But of course, they could go into much more depth if, um, 
uh, if they had half a year to deal with each of the each of the, the component parts of the intellectual property field. But there you are. There, there aren't a number of different intellectual property modules available, and, uh, and the intellectual property module, as it stands, is big enough. So there are several small subjects uh, under the umbrella of intellectual property. You'll be pleased to hear that unlike in real life, the examiner only explores the overlap between them in limited circumstances and in predictable situations as well. So um, uh, uh, I'll mention them when we, when we come to that in a bit more detail. I'm not gonna go into it just at the moment, but um, uh, there are overlaps in practice, and I'm a practicing lawyer as well as, as, well as being a tutor and lecturer. Um, in practice, if you have a client comes to you with a problem, then you will be looking for a number of different angles. You, there, there might be, it might look on the face of it as if it's a patent problem, uh, but uh, in addition to patents, there may be trademarks involved, there may be designs involved, and, and there may possibly be copyright aspects to it as well. And that's not the end of the story. Uh, that's just as far as it goes in relation to the module. So. Uh, while the overlap between different intellectual property rights is very interesting, the examiner is not particularly bothered about it and doesn't complicate matters by, um, uh, by asking you to consider more than one intellectual property right in a question, except, as I say, in limited and predictable situations. Um, one big advantage of the IP course, I don't know how much of an advantage it is over other courses, but there is one of the recommended textbooks available to students in the library and the VLE. Um, it's uh, um, the, the recommended textbooks uh, are all have their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, so it's certainly not a perfect textbook, but it's a pretty good one, and it'll certainly do you well. Um, so you can get through this course studying one of the textbooks without having to buy any more of the textbooks, uh, which is not a bad thing because they are big textbooks um, and. Uh, uh, really, I, I can't see how any student has got time to study more than one of the textbooks. In fact, I suspect that a very small number of the students that I've encountered over the years have ever looked at any of the textbooks. Um, they, they've relied on other materials, but um, a textbook is certainly a very useful thing to have available to you. And the module guide directs you to particular passages and chapters in the textbooks. Uh, so that you can you can read up on the subject. Um, that's something that uh, is certainly highly recommended if you've got time. All students I know are time poor as well as being cash poor. So you know, terrible situation being a student. But um, uh, but at least if you have time to consult one of the textbooks, you will find it online as part of your um, part of what you've paid the university for. In addition to that, there is loads of material available. There are articles which you can access through the VLE um, and elsewhere. If you go looking for them, there's a lot of, uh, of articles that is free access on the internet through SSRN and sites like that. Uh, there are recorded lectures. There are recorded lectures in the VLE. Um, they're rather old, and I know that because I recorded them um, about eight years ago now. I told you intellectual property is dynamic and fast moving. Eight years is a long, long time in intellectual property law. So if you're going to listen to those recorded lectures, treat them carefully. Um, I've got a YouTube channel on which I've recorded a lot of, intellectual, of lectures on intellectual property topics, mostly to do with how to answer examination questions. And as we said, and I've collected um, links to a lot of other intellectual property related videos, which will be of great use to you. I can assure you they'll be of use. It's just you won't have time to watch them all. But um, some of them uh, you will be able to watch and you'll get a lot from them, I'm sure. Um, I'm also recording lectures for London Law Lectures, which will be available um, for a small fee. Well, it might seem like a fairly large fee, but I've got to earn some money somehow. Um, uh, which uh, ultimately, I hope, will cover the whole of the syllabus. There are blogs which will give you information about intellectual property, particularly about latest developments. Um, the uh, the uh, classic intellectual property blog is called the IPCAT. Um, 
um, ipcat, I-P-K-A-T dot com will get you there. Originally set up by my old friend Jeremy Phillips, for the benefit of students that he was teaching, but it's kind of grown since then and Jeremy's no longer involved. Um, but uh, it's got a, a huge amount of information in it and uh, probably so much information you could quickly get confused if you're not selective about what you look at there. Um, I publish information on my intellectual property blogs, including a Substack blog, which uh, goes out as a sort of newsletter. And, uh, and so do lots of other people. So there is a colossal amount of information that you can start to dig into to learn more about the subject. Um, I run weekly seminars, or I have done during the last year, um, uh, and hope to repeat that in the future. So the seminar program will be available. Um, not free of charge, I'm afraid, but um, I think the students who took part in it last year found it very valuable. Uh, there's a Facebook group, which you know about because that's how you got here. Uh, there are, uh, there's a WhatsApp group as well, which I think is much less useful, but um, uh, it gives you another forum in which to discuss things with those other students. And because practice and academia are very close, uh, you will find that many law firms are producing useful materials in the form of case summaries and reviews of developments and so on, newsletters even, um, which uh, you will be able to get a lot of useful, useful information from. So uh, um, bear, in, bear that in mind, bear in mind that, uh, that, that there's a lot of free information coming out of big law firms and smaller specialist law firms, which you'll find very useful. So that's uh, a brief guide to what what's involved when you're studying intellectual property on this course in particular. Um, but what's, what's actually in the course? Uh, well, to start with, although intellectual property is, as I've said, a bundle of different subjects, there are overarching themes which um, the syllabus looks at, at in some detail, actually at the start of the course, whereas I think in many ways it would make more sense to look at some of these things at the end of the course. So, for example, uh, there's quite a large section in the module guide about justifications for intellectual property laws, and indeed the, the textbook go into this topic in quite some detail. Um, and uh, I think I can understand why the authors of the textbooks found this fascinating to write about. Um, whether that makes the subject fascinating to study is another matter. But the sort of philosophical and economical justifications for intellectual property laws are quite important. The examiner frequently asks about them. If you're studying jurisprudence as well, that you might find some cross-fertilization here. So that might be one area where it's worth looking at, um, uh, at the common ground to see whether you can leverage the work that you're doing and uh, actually um, make progress in two modules at once. Um, under this same heading, the module guide deals with the question of unfair competition and its relationship with intellectual property law, which I think is a topic that really ought to come a bit later in the syllabus because um, uh, you need an understanding of some of the detailed stuff that, uh, that you learn during the course of, the, um, uh, uh, of your intellectual property studies before you can really appreciate what the relationship is between unfair competition and intellectual property law. But, um, I'm not going to go into that in detail at the moment. Um, if you want to know more about it, there are lectures and other things that, uh, that I've written and other people have written too. But um, uh, unless you've got a lot of time on your hands, you won't want to be getting into that at the moment. You want to be doing that when the time comes, when you're studying intellectual property. I just wanted to highlight those two overarching themes. And there are other overarching themes as well, the way that intellectual property rights work, the fact that they are they are monopolies. Um, they're not. Uh, they're not complete monopolies. They're monopolies of varying strength. Um, some of them protect you only if the defendant has actually copied what you created. Some of them give you an absolute monopoly, like a patent, for example. If somebody uh, does something that it, uh, within the scope of your patent monopoly, then you can sue them even if they didn't know that your patent existed. And the justification for that is that um, the patent is publicly available information. Therefore, if they didn't know about it, well, they should have done. They should have done their homework. Under those overarching themes, 
Uh, the syllabus explores copyright, designs, trademarks, and patents. Those are really the four big areas of intellectual property which are dealt with uh, in this course. There's also the action for breach of confidence, which is closely related to these, uh, what we might properly call intellectual property rights and, uh, and therefore forms part of the syllabus. I'll come to that a little later. But first of all, let me talk briefly about copyright, which is a, a right which arises automatically, no need for registration or anything, and protects the works of creative people and the rights of organizations that commercialize those creative works. Um, so film producers and uh, recording companies, broadcasters, publishers. That's the subject matter of copyright. That's what we're looking at there. And of, of course, that involves a lot of really interesting stuff. I mentioned uh, already a, a recent case about, uh, about a pop song. Um, uh, one of the cases that you will study while you're looking at copyright uh, involves the book, The Da Vinci Code. So you can see that uh, popular culture is very much involved in this. Um, and there are lots of other cases that I could point to that, uh, that touch on matters which might be of interest to you. But since I don't know what's of interest to you in particular, all I can say is go and look at the, uh, look at the copyright books if, uh, and, uh, and you can pick out things that are going to fascinate you. Um, there's a huge volume of litigation about broadcasts of football matches which is probably a bit too specialized to feature in the in this course but it, it's uh, it's worth bearing in mind that uh, um, uh, that a pub which puts on a, a uh, which sets up a big screen television and shows football matches in the pub for the benefit of its customers can get into big problems and there's a lot of litigation about it a lot of cases um, copyright and designs are quite closely related, and uh, up until 1988, when the current copyright legislation came into existence, copyright was the primary way of protecting designs for most articles. Design law protects the appearance of articles, and copyright law can do still, but copyright law is interested in the design drawings or the design data on the computer hard disk, rather than the design as a sort of abstract thing in itself. Um, but uh, there is a, a, a separate body of law protecting designs and um, a separate string of cases that you, you have to learn about and, and look at. Lots of cases involving designs for cars and parts of cars, lots of cases involving fashion items, cases involving such things as the shape of tablet computers. Um, so again, lots of stuff which is relevant and immediate things that you handle every day or, or, or most days, and uh, which makes copyright law and design law um, uh, something that affects our daily lives. So too with trademarks, um, because every time you go to the sh you go shopping, whether it's in a shop or it's online, uh, you're being influenced by trademarks. You're choosing what you're going to buy because of the trademark that's been applied to, that, to those goods. Uh, and because you've bought those goods before and you recognize a trademark, you identify the producer and you know you can trust those goods. Or in terms of you get a bad message from the trademark and you say, right, I'm not going to buy that uh, because I don't like that producer. Um, and this includes the common law action for passing off, which is a sort of ancient precursor of trademark protection, um, a right which emerged when um, traders started to go to the courts uh, back in probably in medieval times um, and, uh, and say to the judge, uh, look, this guy's pretending that the goods he's selling are mine and he's taking my customers off me. Can you do something about it? And the judge would say, well, yes or no, um, depending on the circumstances. Um, and, uh, uh, and of course, then you get the distinction between the common law jurisdiction and the equitable jurisdiction of the chancery courts. Um, because uh, common law remedies are financial, equitable remedies involve injunctions and things. So uh, very often the trader who went to the judge and said, can you do something about this guy who's ripping me off? He'd say, yeah, I'll award damages. He's got to pay you money. You'd say, well, that's all very well, but I'd like him to stop. So you go off to the Lord Chancellor and you say, will you tell this guy to stop? And uh, a whole equitable jurisdiction 
in the field of Parson North also arose. And it's still going strong. It's going stronger than ever, notwithstanding the fact that in the 1870s, Parliament introduced trademark registration so that instead of going to the judge and saying, Look, uh, I've been trading under this name for 30 years, and here are 100 customers who will all tell you that they recognize my trademark. And when they see somebody else's trademark, which is similar to it, they get confused about it. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, judge, you just need to be patient because it's going to take about two weeks to see all these witnesses, but you do need to be convinced about it. Um, that's a very expensive proposition. I, I, you know, I mentioned it in that rather facetious sounding way, because that's really exactly what happened in a leading modern passing off case in 1990, the so-called Jif Lemon case that you encounter if you study this area. Uh, the parties had to go to court and produce something like 100 witnesses who would say they were confused by the plastic lemons containing lemon juice on the supermarket shelf. Um, and, uh, and it did take a fortnight, and a fortnight in court with, uh, with uh, leading counsel, with junior barristers, solicitors, trademark attorneys, and uh, uh, everybody else who's involved. It's a colossally expensive business. So um, trademark registration has got a lot to commend it as a way of giving businesses much more effective and, uh, uh, and good value remedies when they have problems like this. So trademark registration came in in the 1870s, just at the time that the consumer society was starting to emerge, that people were buying goods according to the, um, the trademark printed on the packaging or otherwise applied to the goods, rather than just on the reputation of the trade that they were going to. They weren't just going to the, the grocer and buying the, the rice or, or well, flour or whatever it was that the grocer sold um, by the pound. They were going and buying a bag of whatever it was, and they were relying on the trademark printed on the bag. Uh, so um, the advent of the consumer society meant that trademarks were dealt with in a very different way. Anyway, um, trademark registration is now extremely important. It's a large, larger part of the syllabus than, uh, than the action for passing off. Um, and the range of what can be registered now is much greater than was originally the case in 1870, and it continues to grow. You've got cases in recent years involving, for example, red soles on ladies' shoes. Uh, you've got um, businesses like MGM, for example, the film studio, re registering as a trademark the sound of a lion's roar, which they've used, they used for many, many years as part of their corporate identity. But only relatively recently has it become something that you can register as a trademark. Not only is uh, protection of trademarks wider, more things being protected, but also there are new ways to infringe trademarks as well, particularly as we move towards so much electronic commerce. Um, Google AdWords caused massive problems when they first started because Google were happily selling um, the right to use certain AdWords to people who, um, who had no right to them. And in fact, they might have been their competitors' trademarks. So all kinds of new trademark problems arose there. You've also got problems these days with goods crossing national boundaries. Goods are sold in one country and somebody buys them up in that country because they're cheaper than they are in other countries, ships them to the countries where you can sell them for more. Uh, can the owner of the trademark stop the importation of the goods uh, into the second market? And the answer is, well, yes or no, depending on the circumstances. But um, uh, I leave you pondering that until you study the subject and, um, uh, and learn about it in detail. Finally, um, well, not quite finally, finally, the, the, the last proper area of intellectual property, uh, what we can truly call a property right, is patent law, which is involved with the protection of inventions. It looks for a novel technical effect, um, something doing something which has never been seen before. So um, a vaccine that gives protection against COVID, uh, it's novel, it's got a technical effect, it can be produced industrially. Um, it's, uh, again, a very topical area. And the whole question of protection of COVID vaccines, as I said earlier, is a very topical one as well. There's also another very topical area uh, where there are a number of emerging decisions at the moment. And recently, the Australian courts, for example, have looked at this um, uh, and, uh, and decided that, um, that it was possible or an artificial intelligence machine to be recognized as an inventor for the purposes of getting, getting a patent. 
Uh, the UK courts have looked at this and said, no, you've got to have a human inventor. That can be the person who's controlling the machine that makes the invention. Well, I've got a problem with that, but it's the human who's got to claim to be the inventor. Uh, and the European patent system has come to a similar conclusion. Australia seems to be differing from us in that respect. Um, but it's a, a whole area that will, well, it will need to be resolved at some stage. And uh, uh, maybe the way that it needs to be resolved is for Parliament to say that if you have a, a, an invention devised by an artificial intelligence machine, the right thing to do is for the person operating that machine to apply for the patent in their name. But we need some sort of clarification about that. It's going to be an area where there'll be a lot of debate and discussion in the future. Uh, but um, I should wrap up by talking about breach of confidence very briefly, because this is a sort of ancillary area, which is very important in the intellectual property field, but not really a form of intellectual property, because there are no property rights that you can identify here, really. Um, breach of confidence is another common law action, um, like the action for passing off, has a very large equitable component to it, and it's based really on similar principles to trust. If you give somebody a piece of property, a house or something, or uh, I think um, the way it originated, you probably know more about equity than I do, because it's a long time since I studied it, but, um, uh, but a knight going off to the Crusades might have, um, uh, might have given his castle to a friend and said, look after this while I'm away. Uh, we'll put it into your name, but I, I'm the understanding that you look after my family and, um, uh, and when I come back, I'm gonna have it back from you. Um, and that creates a trust. And if you give somebody information, which is confidential, then a, a similar sort of transaction is taking place. You're not giving the information to somebody so they can make use of it. You're giving somebody the information um, on trust that they will deal with it according to your directions. Um, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it, it's very often the fact that uh, the action for breach of confidence is used to protect the same sort of thing that you could protect, for example, by a patent. If you can keep your invention secret, then there are big advantages to that. Um, and uh, of course, the, the theory is that the formula for Coca-Cola is a secret. Um, nobody's supposed to, well, a limited number of people are supposed to know it. Same with Iron Brew, the famous Glaswegian um, soft drink with uh, girders in it. Um, uh, the, the recipe for that is supposed to be known to only a small number of members of the family. Uh, so keeping inf information confidential can be extremely important, and the action for breach of confidence protects that. Uh, where the information concern is a trade secret, there is now an EU directive it came into operation early enough for us to have to implement it here, so our law changed. Uh, but, um, but actually, the substantive law didn't really change. It was only the enforcement provisions that had to change to comply with the directive. Uh, so uh, there is a small amount of statutory legislation in the breach of confidence field. Um, from the point of view of your studies, you will probably find it more important that um, that the war on breach of confidence has given rise to a new right of, uh, to protect privacy, a right against misuse of private information, which the judges have created over the last 50 or 20 years um, from, from a sort of um, blend of the action for breach of confidence plus provisions of the Human Rights Act. That's something which uh, at the moment forms part of the IP syllabus. I'm not sure that it really fits there anymore because it's uh, it's departing from strict breach of confidence principles, but it's still there. The examiner still asks questions about it, so you need to know it. Well, that's um, a very brief taster of what's involved in the intellectual property field. I hope it's answered at least some of the questions uh, that, uh, that you might have about it. Um, if you've got any further questions, then um, I'm very happy to discuss them if, you, uh, if you'd like to communicate them to me. But I uh, hope I'll see you on a course on intellectual property at some point in the very near future. Bye for now.